Okay, bye. Good morning. We want to um, discuss with you this morning the attributes of God, what God is. You look in Genesis, the first chapter, and it says, in the beginning, God. And, and we, so when we look at Revelations 1.8, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, said the Lord, what is, what was, and what is to come, the Almighty. So God stretches out from eternity to eternity. We need to have an understanding of that. The Bible describes God as pure light. Let me, let, me, let me tell you why that's important. Because God's message to you is a lamp and a light for you to see the darkness and the wickedness that exists in the world. Because God is light, he reveals light through his knowledge. And when you obtain his knowledge by living by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4, you establish a way to discern what the old man will do versus what the birthed new man will do, transforming by the renewing of the mind. John, 1 John 1, 5 says God is light. So that means the attributes, one of the attributes of God, uh, one of the attributes of God that belongs to God, that is inseparable, that is a property of God, that he uses to bestow upon the one that he would bestow it upon. The one that will receive him, God gives this light. So he sent his son Jesus to the earth because he, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whomsoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But when you look at John 1.14, it says that, that, that Jesus, that word, is, it, it, his name was Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. So he, he, the light came into the world as the word of God. He came in the full volume of the book. And the reason why I keep talking about the light is because when you have the light of understanding of God's word, it is, a, it is a reflection of God through and in you. When you receive and live by God's word, it is a reflection. If God is light, if Jesus is the word and Emmanuel, God with us, then Jesus is light. The thing about light is pure light cannot be seen. Pure light can show you the objects that it shines upon, but pure light cannot be seen. And God is such pure light that it says, compared to God, the sun does not even have a light. That when God comes into the vicinity of the sun, that the brightness of God will put the sunlight out. The brightness of God was so powerful that he told Moses to hide in the cliff of the rock. And I'm going to pass by you and let you see the bright side of me. And the brightness of Moses hiding in the cliff of the rock was so bright upon Moses that when he came down after God had passed by him, and he wasn't looking at God, he was looking away from God, he was looking into the cliff of the rock. But the God's power from his brightness was so bright that people couldn't look at Moses. For, 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 for a spell. And Moses had to put a veil over his head because God had passed by him. And the only thing that Moses saw was the cliff of the rock and God's back. But God was such a bright light that Moses was blinding people. I haven't seen another recording of any man that have came that close to seeing God but Moses. Now, if Moses had to wear a veil to keep from blinding people when they looked upon him, God must be a light that we could not even phantom in our minds. No wonder darkness cannot hide in the light of God. And according to the word, God is his word. Let that sink in a minute. God is his word. Let that sink in a minute. 
So we want to deal with what in God's attributes that he has given the Christian to use. What in it illuminates, reflects, shows an image of God coming from the saint. First and foremost, we got to stop and understand the Trinity in the job of the Trinity. Jesus is God in the flesh, but he's also the light of the world. And those that will reflect off of Jesus, those that will be the image of Jesus, and according to Ephesians 2.10, God made you in the workmanship of Jesus. So he made you the lights of the world for you to reflect his attributes. Some of his attributes would be love, long-suffering, mercy. It would be life. It, it would be uh, goodness, righteousness, holiness. Those are his attributes. So it, when you ask yourself the question, when the man of God has been raised to the position of teaching you, you must understand he spends innumerable hours in the Bible getting understanding of the very word of knowledge that reflects God because it is God, John 1.1. 1, 1. So as he pick up this word that is God, the more understanding he gets, the brighter his understanding is called discernment. So any person that deems to have a thirst or a hunger to know God through his word, the more they use and exercise the light of understanding, they are actually using God's light, reflecting God's light. So as they reflect God's light, they see things in a dark, dark world that Satan has blinded the minds of people. They see things that Satan is doing. And so not only do they see for directions for themselves in the light of their understanding, but they see directions for others. And even when others don't know God, they can see they need God. See, because God just says that I am the Alpha and the Omega. So he's saying, I'm stretched from the time I brought you in, you came from me. I'm the author of you. And he says, I'm stretched to the end, to eternity again. So therefore, what he's saying is this. If you get on board with the wisdom and knowledge and live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, you can understand that you too, through the hearing, of God's wisdom, knowledge, and understanding through the counsel of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you too can illuminate to reflect enough to see dark things moving in a dark world. So you will have the spirit to see things that the natural world can't see because the God of this age uses his power to blind the mind spiritually, even though you can see physically, you can't see things, you can't prepare for things that God is going to do because you have no light to see that far. So you can go to church as much as you want to, but if you're not on Matthew 4, live by every word that receives out of the mouth of God, you are cutting yourself short of having the light of the knowledge. And it's the light of the knowledge from your life that directs you. It's the light of the knowledge that gives you that love that God. It's the light of the knowledge that gives you that long suffering. It's the light of the knowledge that gives you that steadfastness. It's the light of the knowledge that gives you his promises. It's the light of the knowledge that gives you the keys to the kingdom. It's the light of the knowledge that gives you a right to have Jesus in the throne of your heart. It's the light of the knowledge that gives you the right to have Jesus as your mind. It's the light of the knowledge. So we want to deal with the attributes of God because we want to tell you first and foremost, God is absolute. And if you're going to have him, you're going to reflect. You can't hide it. You ain't got to tell nobody with your mouth. If you got the attributes of God, they're going to shine forth just like they did on Moses. And you will be blinding the people in the dark because you got a light from on high. You will blind the old man because you are becoming and transforming to become the new man. So therefore, what you are 
and who you're going to be is whether or not you discern that you need what God has. And if you need what God has, it is your responsibility for you to get salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10, for you to confess with your mouth, believe in your heart so God can give you that light in the attributes of him. Now, let us pray. Spirit of the living God, in the strong name of Jesus, first and foremost, open these hearts, souls, and minds. To everyone that hear this message, or know this message, that they may look at who you are and compare and discern in what they are calling Christianity. Father, and if your light is not shining, is not illuminating, if not reflecting through their lives, let them correct themselves now. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, help us. Open our hearts, our souls, and our mind. Heal, touch, bless, lead, guide, and direct as only you can in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So we started out at Revelation 1 8, and I'm going to read it again. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, said the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I want to look at Revelation 21 6, but I'm going to read Revelation 21 5. Revelation 21 5. And he that sit upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Listen to what he said. He that sits upon the throne says, I'll make all things new. And he said unto me, right for these words are true and faithful. He makes all things new, right for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He said, I will give it to you freely. He's talking about giving you a light of understanding. That you can have an understanding of what he's giving for eternal life so that you can travel to the other side of eternity. Now, let's, let's just really look at what happened. When we go into Genesis 6, you find that it's talking about how God's spirit will not always strive with man. Genesis 6, 3. And it says how God's spirit will not always strive with man. So you came out of eternity as a babe through the womb of a woman. You came into time, and when we got, when man and woman got into time from the very uh, first three chapters of, uh, of Genesis, when man and woman got into time, they got in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because in time was Satan. See, now, now Satan ain't got no power in heaven. So he comes down on earth to where God has now placed the first Adam, and the woman in his garden. And so the tree of good and evil is in the garden. And in that garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, uh, Genesis, second chapter, in that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God has told them, I know he's there. He's telling them, that's Satan. That ain't no apple tree. That's Satan in that, in that, in that garden because he was Lucifer and he took his knowledge and his pride and he gave it to two -third, one third of God's angels in the first earth age. So now he's in the garden in the second chapter. And God is telling what he has walking with him in the cool of the day. That you can eat everything, but there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil over there. Don't, don't touch it because the day you eat of it, you surely would die. By the time they get to Genesis 3, that serpent... That tree of the knowledge of good and evil has walked up to Eve, and the Bible says he is more subtle than any other beast of the field. He walks up to Eve and asks Eve, has God saved? So he blinded Eve's mind with knowledge that sounded like God by asking Eve what God had said. He didn't ask her what the news forecaster said. He didn't ask what the neighbor called it and said, he asked Eve, has God seen it? So it's sin erupted because Eve began to try to have a conversation with one that was more subtle than any beast of the field, and she could not compare her knowledge to his knowledge because she had, did not have the reflection to do the things of God. So when she did, when she began to conversate with him, Satan already knew that she didn't know what God said. She should have directed her conversation with Satan to Adam. But instead, 
is she took the knowledge of Seder and she gave it to Adam. And what happened? They came up all. So darkness appeared in every man's life from that point on. Man and woman was born in iniquity, born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So now man is spiraling in darkness, seeing in the physical, but have no light to walk with God in the spiritual. So in the old covenant, God put something in place. So that man can have a relationship and he chose Israel to do it with. But he had a better plan. He said, in order for me to deal with darkness, the blood of animals is not going to be able to do it. In order for me to deal with darkness, which means wickedness, in order for me to deal with the blindness of man separated from me, I've got to send a light into the world. So he's told Isaiah forecast that I'm going to send a wonderful counselor, a prince of peace into the earth realm and the government will be on his shoulders. And so in Matthew, we find that Jesus has come in the person and prophecy has been opened and the light is here to the point that the stars announce that the light has been born. That light that was sent for the Savior of all mankind came with eternal life on his mind. It didn't come to save man so that he could prosper and from zero to 120 years. It didn't come to save man so he could have a car, a house, and a nice job. It didn't come to save man for physical things, even though he will bless you with the desires of your heart. But Jesus came with the meat on his mind that I'm going to shine a light in your darkness so that you can see your way. And I am not reflecting my word off of myself. I am reflecting off of what the light sent me to do. Amen. So therefore, if you will believe on me, you will believe on the one that sent me. And that you will do to carry out your soul salvation and I'll use you to do the work, John 14, 12. I'll use you to do the work that I did and greater works would you do because I'll use you to have my mind. Philippians 2, 5. So when we look, we want to look at some things and we want to simply understand that we're going to go to 22, 13. And I want to read that in your hearing because it says, and I'm going to start at 10. And he said unto me, seal not the sands of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his works shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates unto the city. So now, that makes us, when we go by Hebrews, that makes us, if we are the ones that are reflecting him, Revelation, I mean, Hebrews 3.14 says, simply put, that we are, for we are made partakers. Who we made partakers of? We're made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, I bet, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned 
whose carcass fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest. But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter because they could not enter because of unbelief. So what are you saying, preacher? Here's what I'm saying. When you fail to understand the chemistry of the most purest light that ever been in the universe, you fail to get an understanding that we are reflectors of that light. That you can see this divine God that is light. It says the heavens declare his glory. Psalms 19, 1 through 3. And the fragments show his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech in our language where their voice is not heard. Through, through nature, from creation, man is able to learn a great deal about God. That's why Romans 1 says that when you knew him as God, you glorified him not as God. It's saying you can look at nature and it's going to declare the God of the universe. Then it goes on to say, number two is that through the printed word of God, in the Bible we have a progression in revelation. In addition to the revelation of nature, we learn to know God from the word as a God of love and a God of grace and a God of mercy. Justice and truth. In it, we have the plan of salvation. In this book called the Bible, we not only have the revelation of our lost condition, but in the fact of sin and distress in the world, but the great truth of redemption through the blood and the sacrifice of another in Jesus Christ. So now, not only do we see God in nature, but we'll see God in the saving work of his son, Jesus. Then in the person, in the person of Christ, to the one that says, yes, Lord. The highest revelation we have in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is one of the persons of the Trinity. In Colossians 1, 5, 17, we read, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created and that are in heaven and are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So now, when we get to the third day in the person of Christ, we can bridge that over to Ephesians 2.10. And understand that in the workmanship, us being created in the workmanship, us being created in the workmanship. Let me say it one more time for the Holy Spirit, because hearing builds faith and faith comes by hearing. Hearing builds faith, and faith comes by hearing. So we was created in the workmanship. Ephesians 2.10, we were created from the workmanship of Jesus Christ, birthed it, being born again, into being the person with the mind of Christ, carrying out the works of Christ. Philippians 2.5, the mind. John 14.12, the work. So we are reflecting Jesus. We're reflecting what his mind was. We're reflecting what his work was. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. If you are truly Christian, you are reflecting off of the son, the head of God, the head of the many member body. You are reflecting what his mind is, Philippians 2, 5, and you are reflecting the better works. So the better works is already entered into the earth because he left it when he said, I must go that he may come. He says that when he comes, tarry till he comes, talking about the Holy, the person of the Holy Spirit. When he came, it sent them to house to house, adding to the church daily, and which is what Jesus told them to do in Matthew. He said, go ye with the gospel. It is the power of him crucified and resurrected that's shining through your heart. So why would you not want to share the power of the gospel? So when we stop to, to understand what I'm saying, when you are the person of Christ, you understand that you have two powers. Let's look at the attribute of the two powers. You have the power to become a son or a daughter of the living God. That means you legally have power to be and ain't no man, ain't no devil, ain't no denomination, ain't no angel can take that away from you. 
you legally, once you say yes, Lord, and you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you legally have a right to be a son or a daughter of God. And people, places, and things they can't take that away from you because <coughs> people, places, and things can't overturn the legal right of God. So you have the power to be. So if you got low self-esteem, Satan can steal your identity by blinding your mind, but you legally have a right to be what God says you can be because there's no other God that can overturn the legal right of God. They can't reverse his word. And then, you not only have the power to become legally a son and daughter of God, but you have the power to decree and declare dunamis. You have the right to use your mouth to reflect God's word. And it is God's word that allows you to eat the fruit of your lips. And the dunamis power of God's word allows you to be that holy priesthood that you can decree and declare. But if you don't have the legal right to be a son or daughter, if you don't have the legal power to be a son or daughter, which is what is written, because what is written for you to be a son or a daughter is that if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that legally brings you in to being born again. Now you have the legal power to use dunamis to decree and declare as a holy priesthood the things that God said in his word because his word is so binding that he holds his word higher than he holds his name. So in the third part of the person that is in Christ, we need to have an understanding that we have legal right to use the power of being a son and a daughter, we have a legal right to use the dunamis, the dynamite of what the word says in the promises to us. And we use it when any imagination exhausts itself up on the battlefield of our mind. We take the word of God, the attributes of God and reflect on that imagination that's coming through our thoughts and we cast it down because we are using the light to see that that thought that is approaching us on the battlefield of the mind is of darkness and it's not of light. So I'm discerning, I'm comparing that the thought that's coming to me is dark and it's not light. So when it exalts itself up against the word of the knowledge of God, and the knowledge of God is the light of my understanding of what is richer. So when I take 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, I understand that I can reprove that thought that's coming from the vain imagination of the dark world and the God of this age. I can cast down that thing that's coming from the flesh that is a hunger and a desire and a lust for me to have. I am the judge over the throne of my heart because I have the mind of Christ, which is the word with us. I have the mind of Christ in my mind to enter into the battlefield when Satan sends a thought to my battlefield in my mind between my two ears. I get to govern because I'm legally a son and I am legally qualified to use dunamis in the word of God that I get to compare what Satan, what the flesh, and what the world is sending to me, and if I want to reject it, I can cast it down if it's not what God said. And the more that I do that in the battlefield of my mind, the more I reflect the attributes of God. And so therefore, if the attributes of God is in the word of God, then I go to church and I don't know that legally because I have confessed that I am a son of God. When trials and tribulations come, I say, well, uh, I ain't nothing but a young Christian. But now see, wait a minute. Wait a minute. See what God is doing towards you. What God is doing towards you is before the foundation of the world. This is a 50,000 watt book. God is going to give you 50,000 watts. In that 50,000 watt bulb, according to the Bible, 
God has already given you everything you need in your calling, Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. And everything you need for a light in this dark world, once you say, yes, Lord, you were birthed it. Number one, legally to be a son or daughter. Number two is you was birthed to use dunamis power, and you have that authority to use dunamis because you have authority to legal be a son or daughter. So you pick up this light, and we want to look at what this light curtails that God has given us. See, because in you, you are filthy right. You just got the blood covering you so that you can do the work of the Lord. But in this light, there is the agape love. In this light, there is mercy. In this light, there is everything that pertains to life and godliness. In this light, there is the promises of God. In this light, there is a place of refuge. In this light, there is a covering for you. In this light, there is salvation. In this light, there is meekness, joy. There is understanding. In this light that he told you to hold, there is everything you need. So now what happens is you fix your mind that you don't have what it is you got, but he's already legally made you a son or daughter because he said in Romans 10, once you confess it with your mouth and believe in your heart, you automatically become. You're legally a son or daughter. To the fact that he asked you the question, what can separate you from one of my attributes called love? Amen. He said not trials, not tribulations, not people, not distress, not oppression. He said nothing can separate you from me. So when I get that understanding that I have that kind of power and there's nothing that can separate me from him, I simply turn my light on. When I turn my light on, being that the light is reflecting off of God, it's not missing agape love. The light is not missing righteousness. The light is not missing holiness. The light is only missing someone to handle it Amen. as a light. Someone to take the knowledge of what is in the light that they may shine it on a dark, dark world. And the more understanding of what they get is in the light, the more they shine it, the brighter it becomes because they are energizing. They are energizing the light because they are living by the word that is in the light. And the more they live by the word that in the light, that's in the light, the brighter the knowledge of their understanding, the brighter the light of their understanding becomes. To the point that when before Satan can move against you, you your light is so bright. That you can see Satan move <coughs> before he prepares to get to you. And you can be casting it down. Mm -hmm. So therefore what happens is that when God has allowed you to use his light. Even though you are filthy right. He's giving you the right to use grace. He's giving you the right to use mercy. He's giving you the right to live by the word. He's giving you the, light, the right to legally reprove, correct, to instruct and be equipped with the light. Show that you can take the light and shine it. And when you see the light, the light needs to be, you can meet appointed times with the light of the knowledge that's in the light. Amen. Now, the light is not yours. So don't start telling people when I lay hands. Uh, and don't start claiming titles because you've got an anointing because the light is to get you from eternity to eternity. The light is not yours to be braggadocious. The light is not yours to make a living and scrut like a peacock because you driving a cat light or wearing a suit. The light is for you to help that orphan, that widow. The light is for you to help that downtrodden person. The light is for you to lift people up that you would love that person like you would love yourself. The light is for you to share the good news gospel that saved you. You want to give it to somebody else that they may be saved. The light is for you to meet the tree of life. The light is for you not to have it one day. The light is for you to endure in it every day. The light is for you to abide in it. He has given you this light for the world. He made you lights of the world. He made you that light of the world through the knowledge of understanding of his power and who he is. It's not yours, but you can use it because the blood stain off the cross was shed upon you that you may be authorized legally to be a son or a daughter, that you can take the light of the attributes of God. And one of the attributes is his love. One of the other attributes 
is that he is also the living. So if you woke up this morning, you were already showing that the light of God's life has shined on you, whether you're saved or unsaved. He continues to shine his attributes because he's the only God that occupies the position of giving life. So if if you're not saved this morning and and you woke up and you can see my five fingers and you can see my light I'm holding, I'm talking to you because you got God's life, but you don't know God's love. You got God's life, but you don't know God's promises. You got God's life and you know nothing about eternity. You got God's life. And you're not living by the fruit of your mouth. You're living by what the world, which is made to blind you, is bringing you. And you're living beneath your identity because your rightful place is in God. He's your creator and your maker. Your rightful place is in God, not in yourself, not in your job, not in your house, not in your car, not in your thoughts. Your your job and your assignment is in the thoughts of what God and God simply said in Jeremiah 29. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace. So he said, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. So the question would be, if you don't know God, and God is not shining a light on your your, your on you to show you the position that you are holding, which is a lost position, and your hand is not very good, so that you can fold it and then pick up and know God that created you and that wakes you up every morning and faithfully, I don't know how old you are and I don't even know who I'm talking to, but I'm going to keep on talking because I want to tell you, if you got life, you using God right now. Suck Mm -hmm. in that next breath. And that next breath that you just sucked in, it came from God. Mm -hmm. Everything you can look at in nature, it came from God. (coughs) The person of Jesus Christ, it came from God. But right now, you legally can't be a son or a daughter, so you don't have the light to see these things that I'm talking to you about. But you can have. You can have. So the deal is, see, I'm no better than the most wickedest pike addict out there. I'm no better than the bank robber. And don't mean I can't lift myself up and begin to pry and begin to pluck and begin to boast. Well, I'm not like that. Because, see, what I got given to me through grace is not my own. So at any time I could fall, at any time I could fall, when I refuse to obey the word of God, when I refuse to do the things of God, any time that I start going down the wrong road away from the light and not living by every word that receives out of the mouth of God, I'm headed the wrong direction. So what then happened is I began to be myself, my natural self. And the world, the flesh, and Satan is stealing my identity and damning my life. And what Satan does is, if you don't know God and never seen God, you blind anyway. You spiritually blind because you can't see the radius of Almighty God, even in what's happening out there today. God knows it because God sends it. God is God of the universe. He's just not God of my life. He's God of your life too. Because if you ain't got number one attribute from him, you got life. And if you were blind enough not to understand there is a God, you really in bad shape. When I say in the person, we're the image of the invisible God. So therefore, we need to understand something. And here's what we need to understand. For it pleases the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. We should dwell in him. And then it says, God who in sundry times in divers spaces, Hebrews 1, 1, 3, and 4. God who in sundry times in divers manner spake in times past unto the Father by the prophet, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory in the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Did you get that? It says he's upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sin, sat down at the right hand of the majestics on high. God is an invisible spirit. He cannot be seen. Only in Christ do we see God. So when we look at his attributes, it pleased God to make himself known to us through his attributes. 
It pleases God because we can't see God walking around in our house. It pleases God for us to see him through his attributes. Let us name some of them. It pleases God for us to see him through his attributes, and his attributes is revealed in his son, Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ. So if Jesus is head of your life, God's attributes is going to be seen through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, in you. The attributes of God are going to come from a Christian. There is no if, ands, and buts about it. The attributes of God is going to shine through the Christian. If you go into church and you've been sitting on the padded pew for 30 years and ain't no love jumped out of you and you still biting people and shaking people and you still in confusion and drama and you still in all kind of this is me and this is you. See, because the unity of the body of Christ works too low. All of us carry each other. All of us complement each other. We don't do the things that divide. We do the things that pull together. And when we don't, and we fail to be able to meet, we sit down and we discuss these things because the love will overshadow many sins. But if each run to his corner, if each run to his own direction, when God assigns you to a group of sheep, because he never puts sins out long ranges, when he assigns you to a group of sheep, and then you break it because you mad with a person, what has God done? Because God still, God still allows you to have a light to reprove that situation, go to the altar, but don't leave your prayer there and go to that person. This is the Bible. This is the Bible. This is the light of understanding. You going to the altar praying and you just walk by Miss Susu right there. And you said in your mind, I can't stand her. And you going to go to the altar and pray? You're not reflecting the attributes of God. God told you don't do that. Because you are in error. And when you are in error, if you got a knowledge against your brother and your sister, you are supposed to get it right because the body of Christ, let me say this one more time. The body of Christ, let me say it one more time. The body of Christ is supposed to be glued together with unity and love. And you think you can enter into a body on your way to heaven that's glued together in unity and in love. And you think you can take your own life and do the things you want, what you want to do and you ain't got to obey. So you're going to go out there and be a lone ranger when salvation is about us helping God get a harvest in and the labors are few. But you so lone ranger, you can't get along with nobody. So therefore, you're going to get out there by yourself. And God is the author and finisher of what you are doing. The devil is alive. You get these churches and you don't want nobody else in your pulpit and the church belongs to Jesus the Christ. He said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail in. And your pulpit is so holy to you that you can't even let another legal child of God stand in your pulpit. Who told you that? There's no church that is on the truth of the word of God that can claim what belongs to God. When you start taking God's stuff and claiming it for yourself, you've headed the same way Lucifer went. Look at Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. You are headed the same way Lucifer get because you begin to be pride over what God has given you, but it's not yours. You use it to bring him glory, but you have to use what he gave you divinely to bring him glory. You can't make up in your mind because you got no righteousness. You got no divinity. He's letting you use it through grace, not of your own. It's his. And you can use it to find direction to eternal life. And if you govern yourself by the light of his word, you can eat the tree of life. But if you pull back and you start doing everything your way, you can't get along with nobody. Everybody is against you. You are a carnal-minded Christian. And so, therefore, when you exalt yourself, when you pick up and you jump up there on that level that you ain't got no business on, and the accuser, who is the legal operative against what God is doing, goes and tells God, God, they, they stole a title. They're doing something they're not equipped for. God, you said, that's what Satan will do as the accuser. God, you told them not to do nothing without love. 
So they make up in their mind they got a God they look. But every time you look, they biting somebody's leg off and somebody is against them. They ain't got no love. The devil is a lie. Right. Because mm-hmm. a love covers a multitude of sin, and I can tell you that verbatim, because love covered me. Amen. When I was a crack addict, a homemonger, a, a thief, and a robber, love covered me. Mm-hmm. Turned me around, spent me around, and he gave me a life. And he put the light of the wisdom and the knowledge of understanding and the counsel of might in my mouth. And I'm giving it to you right now. So I'm here to tell you, all you deceitful workers of iniquity, who saying I'm casting out demons in your name, Lord. I'm praying in your name, Lord. You better go back and check it because if you don't have the necessary attributes, you might have the gift, but you didn't wait on your ministry. So when you jumped up there, them demons on that level have the right to test you. Okay. And you pull something down on your head that you didn't need, which was a battle that you ain't ready for. Because every degree of increase in the knowledge of God, the brighter your understanding gets, the bigger the test. The bigger the test. The bigger the test. You are visible through God, but God is invisible. If you make God visible through you, you manifest his attributes. That's all. You don't manifest what the money is giving you, what the job is giving you, even though you're going to buy the nice house and the nice car. That does not necessarily <coughs> manifest God of your life. Amen. Don't be telling me about your money if you can't tell me about your unity and love for the brethren. Okay. Don't be telling me about your assignment on your job if you can't tell me about the assignment of the gospel. Amen. Don't be telling me who you are and what your title is if you can't tell me what who Jesus is. See, because it's Jesus that's leading that's guiding and that is directing this mini member body. Amen. And we are subject to his mind. We are doing the finishing product of his work. And we are doing it wrapped in the attribute of agape love. And it was for agape love and agape love alone that Jesus was sent to the earth as the word made flesh. Emmanuel, which means God with us. So when you look at Philippians 3.12, it says something. Philippians 3.12. It says in Philippians 3.12, listen to what it says in Philippians 3.12. Not as though I have already obtained, talking about power. Not as though I have already had already obtained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. He said, I follow after. He said, but I follow after. If that, if that I may apprehend that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He said that I may apprehend what I am apprehended. Now, let me explain that because you, that's real deep right there. He said, the call has apprehended me. He said, I was on the road to Damascus, had a letter in my hand and not a Bible. He said, that letter I had in my hand and not a Bible was for me to go persecute, for me to go beat some Christians. The high priest had gave it to me. I was walking in authority. He says, and my call apprehended me, knocked me to the ground. And I asked the question, blind laying on the ground, Lord, who art thou? And he answered, why do you kick against the prick? So my call apprehended me, turned me around from the letter of persecuting Christians, and gave me two-thirds of the word of the new covenant. My call apprehended me, and now I'm trying to apprehend my call. Are you trying to apprehend your call? 
Brother, I count it not myself to have apprehended. He said, I ain't counting my... Oh, boy, that's good right there. He said, brother, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, forgetting those things which are behind, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I'm reaching. I'm reaching forward. This is important. 14 is why we are here. He said, I press. Pressing is not a spectator's thing. Pressing means by force. Pressing means by denial of myself to have what I want to lay hold of. Sacrificing my thoughts for what the way he wants me to think. I'm pressing. Here's what he says. He said, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. He said, it in, it's in Jesus Christ. He said, then let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. If any, if and if any thing be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, where until we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together. Let me say that again. Brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. He said, mark those. Those that don't want to walk in the direction you're walking in, he said, mark them. How can two walk together except they agree? If I'm going the wrong way and I have ceased to be amongst you, what do me and you have in common if I'm walking to the east and you walk into the south. What is there in that person? Or what is there in those group of people that is in you that you crave what they want if you're looking for the truth to set you free? Now let me read it again. Brother, be followed together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you, often and not tell you even weeping, that they are enemies Mm -hmm. of the cross of Christ mm -hmm. in whom is destruction whom God is their belly and whom glory is in their shame who mind earthly things who mind earthly things mm -hmm. if your mind is stayed on God you're not going to treat me wrong mm -mm. if your mind is stayed on God you're going to know mm -hmm. God gave me my gift mm -hmm. if your mind is stayed on God you're going to know God assigned me to help pour into your soul if your mind is stayed on God, you will wait on your ministry. You will do the work of an evangelist. You will do love and unity. You will show the attributes of God. And when you show the attributes of God, you will understand that the revelation of the understanding and the knowledge of God produces what comes from you. See, you can't open your mouth and have God and Jesus sitting <laughs> on the throne of your heart. You can't be sealed by the Holy Spirit and open your mouth and the attributes of God does not come from the attributes of God does not come from you. So what you, you need to understand is if that he's sitting on the throne of your heart and he's sitting down in your heart, then the thing about it is the attributes of who he is is in you. And it will come forward when you open your mouth. So here, look at this right here. So when you are illuminating God, you are illuminating the word that you live by. Because Matthew 4, 4 says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. If you are living by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, don't you know that the word of God that has dunamis power, now you have the legal power to be that son of God, so that means you have legal power to declare the word of God, 
And if you have the legal power to be a son or a daughter of God, you have a legal power to declare the word of God. And when you declare the word of God, the word of God has a dunamis power that produces the fruit that God says it will produce. Let's look at some of the fruit, the attributes of what God's word will produce. God's word will produce his promises. God's word will produce his power. God's word will produce his blessing. That's why Deuteronomy 28 says, if you diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord, that the blessings of God will run you down and overtake you. It'll run you down in the field. It'll run you down in the city. It'll run you down going. It'll run you down coming. So the word of God will illuminate from your heart because it goes in through your ear gate and can be used out of your mouth gate. So when you look at Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18 says that you can live by the fruit of your lips. If the fruit of your lips is illuminating the adulterated word of the Holy Scriptures, then 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that the Holy Scriptures allows you to look at your situation and shine your light of knowledge on the situation, and you can reprove the situation that's not right. You can correct the situation that's not right. You can be instructed on how to have the things that God has promised you because you can remind him of his promises. So therefore, you become a reflection of what is written. By using your mouth, by using your ear, and by using a renewed, transformed mind, it equates to that you can present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. If you have those attributes, you have the light of the knowledge of God. If you don't have those attributes, you need to go talk to God because you might not be a Christian at all. This is Pastor Sampson. We'll see you Tuesday.